uh, we, we have to apologize. Uh, Mike Smith was supposed to be on our panel or up here today speaking, so we'll have to handle the first part of this on the uh, development side. So I, I'm Brett, work on, uh, on the construction side of things. And um, I'm Laura, and I oversee the design, the interior design side. All right, so uh, one of the first slides we have up is kind of the reason why the PGA of America decided to come to DFW area. Um, I find one of the things I found interesting on the slide is that the, uh, the, the, this is the only region in the U.S. that hosts three Fortune 10 companies. Uh, I thought that was interesting uh, on the, kind of the, 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 the bandwidth of DFW. Most of you guys may be from DFW. If not, um, the, the area is still growing. It's massive. <clears throat> um, it talks about the population growth 19% since 2010. Um, number of re residents continues to increase. Um, second fastest growing city uh, uh, by Forbes. Um, and again, you see the kind of the population growth. Doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. And I think it's kind of accelerated even through uh, COVID with a lot of people relocating uh, further south. Um, again, uh, just kind of more touch points on why um, DFW area uh, and, and Frisco in general, we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, favorable tax climate, uh, certainly one of them, uh, no state or local tax. Um, property tax is a different story, but certainly on the, the income side, uh, nothing. So um, high quality of life. Um, I, I laugh all the time. If, if you want to find something in, uh, in, in Dallas to eat, uh, you should not have a problem, uh, no, no matter what kind of food. And that, that talks to uh, the slide as well. Um, and again, I, I think PJ of America was really trying to, um, trying to figure out exactly where to come uh, to locate their facility. One of the critical things was kind of the, 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 the multicultural population, uh, the hubs of the airport, um, highly educated, skilled people as well to be able to select and choose from uh, from the area, which was super important. A lot of young professionals that live in and around DFW um, talked about uh, PGA of America, and they said they initially employ around 100 people. I'm not sure exactly how many people have in that building now, but I think they have at least that many, if not more, um, coming here. Um, and then one of the other things, uh, talk about the partnership with uh, Frisco Independent School District. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to go over to the other side of the campus. Uh, PJ headquarters are located over there, but they also have um, some really neat, cool stuff for kids uh, in that area as well. That's kind of through the school system. They have a little putt-putt course, um, teaching facility over there as well. Um, so that was very key to them for that partnership. Um, and then the headquarters will impact the future of the game. I think, um, you know, one of the things that they were realizing in Florida was it was kind of, I don't know the right word, but a little bit older crowd, a little bit kind of stodgy, a little bit um, kind of the old way. And they wanted to kind of move uh, the PGA of America into kind of the future of the game. And they thought that um, Frisco, Dallas area was kind of the, the right area for that as well. So uh, one last thing I, I didn't touch on the last slide was um, it was very important to them for the public um, to be able to play these courses. So this is not a private course. Everything you see is a public course. Um, so uh, anybody from public can come and play. Um, it's not, it's something that the PJ of America was hugely, hugely for, and they did not want, they wanted to make sure it was available to everybody and anybody that wanted to play the game. Um, so that was one of the overriding th themes um, through all this as well, and kind of being very inviting uh, to, to the public. Again, I don't want to insult you guys' intelligence you all got here, but um, to kind of get, get a little bit of uh, mileage from Dallas, Fort Worth, I was telling Cole, uh, this morning, uh, we drove up from our office in downtown Dallas, and it took us about 35 minutes, so no traffic. Uh, with traffic, it's a little bit hairy, but uh, this morning it was, it, was, it was quite lovely. So, so um, one of the things that Omni likes to do is like really research the city and the place that we're going to build the hotel. So when we were starting the development, we started to dig into Frisco and... It seems like such a new community, but it dates back to 1902 when the railroad was coming through here. And I think one of the fun facts that we found out is their logo is actually a, um, a raccoon pelt. So you can see it now. You'll never be able to unsee it. Um, I always thought it had something to do with the, um, with the train, but no, it's actually a, a raccoon. So um, as we were meeting with the city and trying to figure out what was important to them, um, they have attracted all of these sports teams, and they are they have noted themselves as Sports City USA. And so you can see on the top all of the sports teams that are headquartered here, and it's also um, known as the top place to raise an athlete. So giving children in the school system the ability to have access to all of these sports as well is really interesting, and Brett talked about how... Um, the access to the PGA of North Dallas through the school system has their own 
um, building on the west side of the campus. And the other thing is there's days that they can play the course, again, since they're all public, and like having access to this level of a course when you're in middle school and high school is really, um, really incredible. The other thing that we started to dig into was um, the story of the land. So the land was actually put together by a gentleman named Bert Fields Sr. And he, when he got out of high school, he bought this truck. It was called the White Western Truck. It's um, almost like a semi, but it has equipment on the back of it for oil and gas. And what he would do is he would drive to the oil fields and he would offer his services. But what was happening is people wouldn't be able to pay him back. And how they were compensating him was in land. So he was able to put this parcel together of a little over 2,500 acres and he made it into a working ranch, which he then gave to his son, um, Bert Fields Jr. But what's really interesting is he didn't have any family, and so when he passed away, he left the land to um, a lawyer who is actually just oversaw the, um, all of the assets that the, the Fields family had. So what um, we were able to purchase 660 acres um, from that from that gentleman, and that's what made up the entire site. So we found the truck in a barn on the side, so like on land that we actually didn't own. And there's a piece of there's a piece of photography in everyone's guest room that is that white western truck. And we felt like it was really important to like continue to tell that story and everybody tell that story of how the land was originally, um, what it was used for. So this is the map of the 2,500 acres that made up uh, the Fields Ranch. Um, as you can tell, it's kind of hard to see a little bit, but um, you've got the uh, golf course on the kind of upper, uh, kind of left side of, the, of the, the plan. That's the golf course with the resort. As you can tell, we're 600 acres. Uh, I guess we're uh, right around <clears throat> a fifth of uh, the overall development site. You can see uh, uh, out there, they're clearing land as of today uh, to develop all the residential up along the golf course and south of there as well. Um, and then to our east, uh, you've got, I think, I, I don't know if it's still called the link or not, but it was um, when we did this presentation a long time ago. You'll see a lot of, we actually took this presentation, I thought it was interesting, to kind of show you what we presented maybe two or three years ago, that not much has really deviated from that. Um, but that is uh, another area that's going to kind of tie into the overall golf theme as well. Um, uh, but anyways, the, the preserve, I found interesting, we were talking about this earlier, but um, the, the, the real estate out here is unreal. Um, the lots, anywhere from half acre to an acre site, are going from anywhere from a million to two million dollars just for the lot. Um, and who, who would have thought that in Frisco, Texas, on the north side of Frisco, um, even four or five years ago? Um, again, kind of honing in on our site, uh, you see kind of the golf um, kind of zone, and then the, all of the public area, kind of where we're sitting, I say public area, it's not the right word, but the, the buildings, the infrastructure, uh, kind of where we're sitting now is in the kind of the upper quadrant uh, on the right-hand side. Um, so we did all the development up along uh, PGA Parkway, um, uh, access to hotels, to golf, um, to the retail side. Um, so again, 660 acres. Um, 600 of that is basically golf, uh, and then the rest of it is going to be your, your public infrastructure. And you can see, see the kind of the, the red kind of uh, on the far upper left-hand corner. And it's, hard to, it's hard to make out, but that is the PGA uh, headquarter building as well. So getting into the um, interior design, Brett's going to walk us through the program. Yeah, so real quick, again, I don't want to insult your intelligence on being able to read this, but uh, the main keys here is 500 keys. Um, that does not include the ranch home. So the ranch homes, uh, originally we were going to develop seven on the western side of the hotel. And we actually ended up adding um, uh, three more on the eastern side. We thought they were going to be so successful we decided to add a couple more. Um, and these are a little more private on the east side as well. But those are made up of those. Each, each ranch home has four guest rooms. The thought was is that you could have a basically a, um, a golf uh, you know, a, a group outing. Uh, four people typically, that's usually a foursome that goes out. Uh, the idea was is that you could rent those homes um, and not stay at the hotel if you don't want to. It has their own kitchen. Um, it's got their own living room. Um, uh, they're, uh, anyways, they're, they're, they're something special. Uh, they're really, 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 really neat. Something we haven't done before, but something we, we probably look to do further, uh, further expanding on that program and other uh, resorts that we have as well. 
um, conference center. Uh, we're in it now, so we're in the junior ballroom. Grand ballroom is over next door, 23,000 square feet. Another 25,000 in meeting space. There's an event pavilion, um, which if you haven't got it, see, it's really, really cool. It kind of looks like a, you know, what do you what do you call it, Laura? Almost like a barn kind of setup. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but a uh, really cool uh, space over there. Uh, indoor, outdoor, uh, kind of opens up to everything. Uh, food and beverage. Um, again, you, you probably, have, if you've stayed here last night, probably ate at a couple of places, uh, or maybe not. I'd love to go out and get out. There. Um, and this is all at the hotel. And then on the west side of the site, you've got the clubhouse. Uh, it's 80, uh, 30, 38,000 square feet. I will say about a third of that is actually underground parking. So it's a little deceiving that the building itself actually shows closer to about uh, 20,000, 25,000 square feet. Uh, and then the PGA district, uh, that's what we call it. Um, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's been renamed now. It's the Monument Realty PGA district. There you go. So Mouthful, have a sponsor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is, it's something that we, again, we took it on um, that, it, and we'll, we'll, I think Laura will speak more to it, but, um, it was uh, a retail district that we have never done before, uh, but we, we actually own and operate most of those retail shops over there. Uh, the only ones that we don't operate are Vineyard Vines, and I guess technically PGA store is run by, is it, is, no, it's not. No, we're running it. Okay, we're running it. There yeah. we go. Um, so, uh, again, something that we, we're not quite using. We, obviously, we have uh, retail in our hotels, but to do it standalone like that is, is somewhat different for us. Um, the only place I can think is maybe maybe Mealy Island type mm -hmm. uh, stores, and then the PGA Performance Center. I won't touch a whole lot on this, but um, it's a really cool facility. It actually has hitting bays that open up onto the golf course, and it's being run by the uh, PGA of America. Um, so if 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 you're a good golfer, bad golfer, uh, they have a lot of coaching over there, club fitting, um, really state of the art um, kind of technology that they have. Uh, really really cool space. If you have a chance to check it out, I encourage you to check it out. There's um. So there's a promenade that connects from the last ranch house all the way to um, the PGA of America headquarters, and it's a mile. So, like, guests can traverse through all of that. And then the, there's public parking that's accessed to the PGA district. So most of the people that are coming there on the weekends are locals and people driving in from DFW that are eating in the restaurants, taking advantage of the putting and the three, um, the par three course. And it actually, the promenade, it does stop, but there's a hike and bike that picks up at the end of the promenade here and actually goes around the golf course. It doesn't quite connect. You can if you want to get there. Um, I can't remember the exact mileage, but it's I think it's over three miles from start to finish. And, and that was a requirement by the city as well. The hike and bike trail is actually pretty cool because we actually use it for tournament setup. So all the back house, all the truck movements, all the semi trucks actually use that hike and bike trail. It makes a, it makes a full almost a full 360 uh, you know, all the way around the entire resort. So really cool. And I think that's something we probably didn't talk about um, from the beginning is I don't think there's been another, we have, you know, the two 18 whole golf courses, none have ever been designed and built in order to hold, to like host a tournament. So a lot of the, um, the thought and effort that went into that was, where the stands were going to be placed and where the hospitality tents would be placed and how all of that would be accessed from the road and how we were shuttling people in. So it was um, a really unique challenge on our side. There's a lot of land that was able to make that easier. And we've already hosted the um, senior championship. And we're set to host um, in 2027 the PGA championship, then we've got the women's. Every year there is a tournament. Some of them are smaller, some of them are high school, and then we're set to host the um, Ryder Cup in 42. So, and I'll speak to that when we talk about the clubhouse, some of the things that we designed around. I think the next slide is kind of more of the same. Again, we'll kind of speed through this, but um, one thing that I, uh, just to note, there's 13 dining outlets, which means we have about 13 different kitchens around the resort. That was quite challenging. Uh, it was the biggest uh, spend that I've ever been a, a part of as far as food and beverage. We ended up spending over $6 million, close to $7 million just on equipment um, at this resort. So quite, quite crazy. So uh, you, can, you can speak to this. Yeah, I was going to say, from, we, we talked about a few of these, but from left to right, you've got uh, Golf Performance Center. Um, again, that opens up under the range. Really cool. Check it out. Ice House. Uh, neat spot if you want to grab a beer, grab some barbecue, uh, right up against, it's actually pressed up against the short course, which I think some of you guys may have played yesterday. Um, so really neat kind of area. The, the, everything is built, the whole uh, retailer is kind of built around what we call the dance floor, which is the, uh, I believe it's close to two acres uh, putting surface. 
Um, so that th th we, we kind of use that as our anchor, call it our beach, uh, so to speak, to anchor the retail. Um, and then most of the retail, you see Top Golf, Lounge by Top Golf. Uh, we actually own and operate it, so it's not one that they operate. Um, uh, the, there's other retail buildings around there as well, but they keep going to the right, you see the ranch homes, um, sandwich uh, in between both uh, sets of ranch homes. You actually have the clubhouse, and then we have the resort. We have uh, meeting space, which we're in now, and then the event pavilion, which we, which we mentioned as well. What's not showing up on the screen, again, this is, I mentioned this is previous uh, rendition of this, is the additional three ranch homes that extend beyond uh, the event pavilion. And the other thing to note is the driving range is people are hitting in for, from four sides. So there's live hitting bays out um, from the PGA of America. Then the Performance Center, all of that opens up to the outside that hit. We've got hitting bays on the Ice House, and then the North Texas PGA, which is for the high school, also hit. So it's really unique that everything's coming into that center section. And Laura mentioned it, but the, the, the high school kids literally have their own driving range at this resort. It's kind of crazy. Um, so there's going to be as many high school players on this, on this uh, kind of overall campus as there are uh, normal golfers. So I think it's one of the benefits uh, to building all this and to the PGA's partnership is that um, it's, it's the future of golf and those kids are the future of golf. So. And we, the project went on um, hold for like a year during COVID and Brett and I were talking about the things that we were able to kind of tweak and change as we were going through. And one of those, if you all have been to the PGA district, is... Um, we had the, um, the putting area extended the whole way underneath the screen, but what we were able to do is like carve some of that out and add turf so that we have an event lawn so that you can have an event. There's multiple places over at the PGA District, but the best one is probably right in front of the screen and it has a stage um, there so you can have a full band. We've got it all, um, the power yeah, we learned a lesson over the years. If you have an event, um, they, they like to tear up the grass. So we figured to go ahead and get it the, the turf down. You'll notice outside of all these ballrooms, we have turf as well. It just holds up. There, there's just no way the grass holds up over the over the years. So again, I think it's as much of the same. Um, we can probably blow through this slide, Laura. But the, where the tennis courts were, we actually did the ranch halls. We had tennis courts before. We just didn't realize, you know, how to how to, we didn't we didn't know how to manage that quite well. But we also thought the ranch halls would be kind of the the, the nice kind of upgrade as well. So, um, I mean, as you walked in yesterday, um, the inspiration behind the resort was a modern ranch home. And then we were trying to do sophisticated nods to golf and Texas, um, but also make it feel very residential, even though this hotel is quite large. Um, Brett mentioned previously that we were calling the golf course our beach. So all of the glass, all of the views, we were trying to focus out towards um, towards the golf courses. The other thing that you'll notice, um, hopefully as you go around, is we wanted it to be about community connecting. So people that are coming for a wedding or um, for a conference, that there's lots of places to gather, either during your meeting or after. Uh, the front desk, the since we were developing the golf courses, we had access to the landscape and golf designers, and they gave us the final topography of the 18th um, green on the east course, which is the harder course, the one that all of the um, championships will be played on. And we were able to create this out of plaster, and it it was made in, I think, nine panels, and each one of them went un up individually and then were, were pieced together. The, um, off the lobby bar, we call this the library, and wanted to have a space that was a little bit more casual. And we found that the pool table, every time we're out here, people are playing pool. And one of the other changes that we were able to make was the roof on the top of the all-day dining restaurant was just um, not accessed, but we turned it into an event space. So you can actually have an event out on um, that roof structure, and the views are spectacular because you can see all the go golf and then like all the way down the promenade. Um, I know a couple of you all have mentioned the artwork. Artwork is um, very important to Omni, and we want it to be unique. The piece that's over the fireplace is a bandolier, but instead of having bullets, 
It has golf tees, and we called all of the places in the United States that hosted the Ryder Cup, and they gave us 10 tees, and then we put in 10 tees from uh, Fields Ranch in hope, you know, in expectation of hosting it in 42. I'm learning stuff today. I didn't even know that. The, um, the cowboy hat is our owner's. He gave us that to use. Um, so it's, it's just a very special piece. It's like a fun story to tell. And a lot of the accessories we were, we were able to buy locally at local antique stores that, again, tie into the ranch story. The golf shop we call Toast and Tea is a little bit of a throwback to um, golf outfits that are more vintage. So we're kind of deconstructing that with the color, the artwork over the banquette is all golf tees. And then we were had it printed, the pattern on top of it. It's really unique if you all have an opportunity to go in and look at that piece. And then the um, speaking to this, the spaces to gather, so this back lawn area is tiered. We wanted it to be that you can, everybody could see, so we tiered it down. There's fire pits. There's this long promenade that's for ADA, but it does make it a nice walk. And then the other thing that was really challenging, and Brett can probably speak to this better than me, but with us, have, we wanted the hotel to be long and low. When we did the design competition, there were some people that proposed like larger buildings, but it was we wanted it to just feel like it stretched all the way along the golf course. But that created challenges with the city because with it only being um, six stories, we have a fire lane that goes all the way around the resort. And we were trying to be very intentional that it felt like part of the landscape and the architecture, and it didn't just feel like a fire lane coming through. So in the far um, side of this, you can see the fire lane come up, but you can technically drive over all of that furniture, and it's the fire lane on the back side. Yeah, Laura's right. It was a challenge, but this is one of the areas that we focus most of our attention on. I think we changed this. I don't know how many times we changed this. We changed it a lot. A lot. Uh, we thought it was probably one of the more critical pieces, not just from golf looking back, but from from hotel looking out on the golf as well. So this is the um, corridor to the meeting space. You probably traversed this when you were coming from your guest room. We have bocce courts out there. Again, you can see the fire lane, um, but. The trying to create unique spaces, the one thing that we were very intentional on is that you can have different groups in-house that are not interacting with each other. So you can have an outdoor group here, the junior ballroom, you can't see the grand ballroom lawn, and then the pavilion, we specifically put the lawn on the opposite side of the pavilion. So again, you have your own privacy, you feel like you have your own um, personal event. This is the pre-function space. This is actually outside of the grand ballroom. Again, natural light was very important. And how you were seeing the, the green. It, I think the first time I came up to the site, I was very surprised. Like, there's not, this is, it, it did not feel like you were in DFW, Dallas. It felt like more hill country. And we were trying to capitalize on that every opportunity we had. The carpets are a lot of plaid. We have plaid on plaid. And um, in the grand ballroom, the light fixtures were inspired by golf balls. So they look like they're almost suspending. If you will have the opportunity to go in there, I think they were extremely successful. Um, one of the other things we're doing right now is we're making the grand ballroom a little bit more focused towards um, groups and events. And then the junior ballroom in our new developments, we're doing more um, decorative we feel like it's better for like a gala or a social event or a wedding. So you can see the Rulon ceiling on the ceilings here and the light fixtures are a little bit more decorative. So it's funny, we, we, we talked about this, but like the, the ceiling is, is the Rulon ceiling. And so it's got acoustical properties and in addition to being wood, but I think this ceiling, don't, don't leave this room with this, but I think it's about a million dollars, just the ceiling. Um, and I told Laura, I was like, well, we can't afford it. And she goes, well, I'll do something different in the grand ballroom to afford it. So we actually, I actually think it turned out pretty nice too. But we did just a lot of simple moldings uh, within this ballroom versus here. We, we spent a lot of money in, in this ballroom to make it kind of that special, kind of intimate uh, social ballroom. And in addition to that too, I think Laura touched on with the, the pre-function, we actually oversized probably a little bit bigger than we normally do in our hotels, uh, just given kind of the, the space we have beyond that to kind of interact with. So 
This is the pavilion. Um, we call it Panther Creek Pavilion. And this is the lawn that's on the side that's opposite from the hotel. And this space is, you know, it's, I don't know, I want to say white box, but it's not white boxed. It's got concrete floors. It's got one wall of stone and then all of these doors open out. So you can, and it has an area, we were very intentional to have a, your own separate valet. So if you are local and you're having a wedding or an event, you can valet here separately. We also did that at the conference center in addition to the hotel. So we were, I think Brett and I were talking, we think this is our 10th or oh my God. 12th hotel new build to do together. And every time we're learning more and trying to incorporate that in. Speaking of which, we had to install a similar type ceiling in there too, because we had acoustical issues at one of our hotels we built. Uh, years ago, and we didn't want to make the same mistake, and we think it's been very successful. We actually attended a party, uh, and there not too long ago, they had a band, and it sounded really good. So we we, we, we try to improve, but we, that was one of the lessons we learned. Mm -hmm. So we have a Makara Spa. It has um, 21? 20, 20, 20, yeah. 20 treatment rooms. The the first floor again, things that we're learning. It has it. You can drop off at the valet, so we're trying to attract locals that you don't feel like you actually have to come into the hotel to access the spa. On this level, it's the salon services, and then you drop down. We have a cafe and a spa pool. So if, you, if we're not super busy, you can buy a day pass, and you can have lunch and access the pool. But if we're busier, you have to have a spa treatment. Um, that you, but you can stay all day, and we can serve lunch out on um, this pool patio, but then there's also an interior space to have lunch. There's a co-ed, really large um, relax area, and then men's and women's locker rooms that have um, a hot tub, steam, and sauna in both the men's and the women's. This is the apron. I think this image has been skewed slightly, but... It is the all-day dining, and what we were able to do here is put a bar in, and it has direct access onto the family pools. There is ice cream here, so the kids can come in and have ice cream on a um, like while they're accessing the pool, and you don't feel like you have to leave the area in order to have lunch. We'll also serve lunch out on the, the space as well. We did like a whole um, kids' splash pad with... Um, water, things that shoot up, and there's cabanas that are separate. But um, this is probably my favorite space. Uh, Laura likes horses. I do like horses. <laughs> they, um, we are calling it Trick Rider. We did some research, and there is a woman named Sydney Yokely Woodard, who is the, American, the founder of the American Porter Horse Association, and she was also a rodeo trick rider. So the entire restaurant is inspired by women trick riders. And we just had a whole lot of fun with it. This um, horse has 4,000 crystals that are um, strung individually. It was made in the Czech, um, in Czechoslovakia. And they put the whole horse together and then took it back apart. And then they came and installed it. There's um, artwork that are pistols and spurs and in all of the um, bathrooms, there are vintage women trick riders. These are belts that we had artwork printed on. Um, it's a fantastic space if you all have the opportunity to, um, to see it. It's got a private dining room and a large wine room. It also has a separate valet, again, trying to attract the locals. So these are the ranch houses. You probably walked by them last night. Um, They're all exactly the same. They are four bedrooms, four and a half bathrooms with a living room and um, dining room kitchen area. The dining room tables turn over so that you can play cards. So there's felt on that other side. We have um, a concierge that's dedicated only to these ranch houses. And that's all he does is reach out to the guests that are coming in and tries to customize the experience for them and curate what, what their needs are. They all have a patio off the back. And the ones that are over by the pavilion, the view is spectacular. It's just like all green. There's a putting course out. And then they have shared fire pits that they all share. I actually think the ones on that side are pretty cool, too, because you actually have long views all the way down the golf course. Really beautiful. One of the things we actually learned... Uh, on these, which is interesting. We, we, we built these four kind of the golf foursomes, 
And what we found is there actually is a lot of family demand for this. So uh, if we had to do it all over again, could we go back and build a couple more queen queen beds in some of these rooms versus all king? So. So this is the um, standard guest room, I think, that you all stayed in last night. And the concept here was if you woke up in the most luxurious men's locker room in the world, like what would it feel like? So we had a lot of fun with plaid on plaid. We've got the window pane, plaid, wall covering, the plaid carpet. Then we've got the Glen plaid on the sofa. We had a little fun with uh, pillows, incorporating in the cow, the faux cow hide, mimicking, you know, reckoning back to the ranch days, and then the collage over the, the, um, the sofa. The one thing that we've really been working on on both new builds and new developments is not having that traditional desk and sitting up against the wall and how you can work in your room but also have a great in-room dining experience. So all of the rooms have this activity table. Um, we positioned it so that it's easy to work off of. And um, so if you do need to do some more serious work, we put the chair in there so you're not sitting on the sofa. And there was a lot of testing this of can you sleep on it? And <laughs> most people's legs hang off the end, but um, I think if, if you didn't get an extra room, your child can sleep on it. The, um, these are the family pools. They are tiered down. So the idea was that at the one at the top that you could see over onto the golf. Um, there's a pool bar as well at this space. And we also have the adult pool that's on the roof that has its own bar. There's additional meeting space up in this area, and you can access directly out onto this pool. So if you wanted to have a cocktail reception, there's cabanas that you can't see um, up behind that look out all over the, um, the PGA district. And the other thing, again, we, we just focus so much on tiered seating. So the Cabanas are at the highest level, then you've got the chaise lounges, then you get down to the pool. There's an infinity edge, and then there's a whole nother row of chaise lounges below, so everybody has a great, great view. This one was out of order. This is the um, pool bar, and you can see the kids' area in the background. It's actually right out of the windows in this space. And Brett talked on it. Um, touched on it a little bit. This is Lounge by Top Golf. This is the second location that they have. Um, the first one was in Washington State. And this has the, the hitting bays that are the simulators. Not only can you play golf, but you can play all sorts of other games. We were intentional to separate off the back portion so that you can have a group and you can rent it out privately. I think that's the one thing that we were really focused on as we did this is like, how is group going to use this? How are people going to enjoy the space, but then still be open to the public? And you have a private experience, but yet open to the public. So this is a view of the um, simulators, the hitting bays that are in the lounge. Let's see, This is the ice house. So this has the live hitting bays. And it, we have the top tracer technology, which is um, the top golf technology. All of the the garage doors open, and then you can reserve a bay. And then the picnic tables overlook the three par course. The and then you can also use this to wait. Um, so that top tracer technology is available here, but it's actually available throughout the driving range, which is again another uh, maybe upgrade. You probably have seen that at some golf courses, but it's not on every one of them. So. so this is the image of the hitting bays off the back of the ice house, and you can see the PGA of America in the distance and they're heading towards the middle as well. This is the um, golf clubhouse. So we have, it's open to the public, but the second floor is private membership. So I think we're going to sell about 300 private memberships. We're, I think, a little over halfway there right now. It's quite pricey to join. Um, but there are some fantastic perks with not only do you have access here, but there's reciprocity with some of um, the uh, some other clubs, also Omni Golf, and then addition to that, you're getting tickets to the PGA events that would um, otherwise be hard to get. So, the this is on the second floor. This is the men's and women's locker rooms. There's a co-ed lounge that has a bar that's in between these two spaces. Um, one of the things that 
was really unique is we designed the clubhouse in order to host the 42 Ryder Cup. And the requirements are that the teams have to be able to meet and have the coach be able to talk to them and not have the space separated at all. So we designed this where one of the teams would use the co-ed lounge, but what the space wasn't big enough. So we had to take the exterior patio, put in nano walls so that that could all open up. So there was just a lot of things that we were working around parameters that we hadn't typically had typically done. So this is that patio, and you can see that there's nano walls here. There's nano walls on the other side that opened up into the lounge um, so that all of it can be air conditioned or heat or cooled. This is the Ryder Cup grill. This is on the first floor. This is open to the public, serving as the 19th hole um, for the space. The PGA of America was very generous of giving a lot of um, memorabilia that we were able to use. We created vitrines. There's um, a digital board that's out in the lobby of the space that talks about the evolution of the golf club and the golf swing. There was a gentleman that donated clubs uh, that he had collected over the years um, that is basically outlines the exact way the golf club was developed over time. All right. So touch real briefly on budget. Uh, again, this was the slide was developed probably two or three years ago. So things have changed a little bit from here. Got uh, updated numbers. So the I believe the PGA headquarters building is around that thirty million dollar mark, uh, but our total all in cost uh, is actually closer to five sixty uh, now. Um, and some of that had to do with adding things like Laura talked about it throughout. You know, adding the deck over the three mil. We added uh, ranch homes. We actually added in addition to this all of the fit out retail because originally we were going to sell it. We we're going to you know basically have other people come in at least. Uh, the space, but when the COVID happened, uh, that didn't happen so much. We ended up taking over those and fin fitting those out as well. So breaking it down in components, uh, uh, resorting up being close to about $300 million. Uh, this says 290 uh, Land cost didn't change. Obviously, we're right around $57 million there. It's not showing up here, uh, but that's included in the golf. The golf is about $125 million and then $35 million for retail. So kind of the breakdown for, for, for the budget. And then from a project schedule standpoint, again, I left this in here. Uh, this was uh, developed about two or three years ago prior to us breaking ground and prior to COVID happening. Uh, but as you can see, we, we actually slowed down a little bit for COVID. It's not showing up in here, uh, which I found quite interesting. Um, so originally, we were going to break ground in May of 2020. We decided to put a pause on that, uh, given what was going on uh, happening in March and April uh, of that year. Um, and we ended, up not, we ended up starting construction on the hotel about a year uh, after we, we were going to. Uh, but one of the things that we couldn't stop was the, the golf courses. So we actually broke ground on those uh, in uh, 2019, in summer 2019. And uh, we actually played uh, on the courses, uh, kind of a, a preview with ownership in uh, October 2021. Um, and then we did not allow any golf to be played on that all, all the way up until basically members were on it in April of, of this year. Um, so talk about a growing period. We, we typically grow in period for, for a golf course of this nature would be six months uh, to a year. Um, we let this one grow in for about two and a half, three years. Um, so to say it was established is, uh, is an understatement. Um, and part, again, part of that was driven by the fact that we want to kind of unveil everything at the same time. Um, again, I think a uh, couple of things I want to touch on uh, on this slide too, or we, this is actually a good one too. This is uh, this was taken, um, uh, you can see a lot of the infrastructure was in on the parking lots and roads, and that was uh, that was by strategy. The soils here are quite awful. Um, if you've lived in North Texas or you live here now, uh, you'll know that a lot of those, uh, the, the, the clays are expansive, uh, a lot of clay. Um, and anytime it rains here, the site becomes a complete mess. So parking's a challenge, getting around the site's a challenge. So we actually did the, the promenade. Uh, we did all the road infrastructure and parking uh, prior to starting a lot of the, the actual buildings, you'll see a lot of the building pads hadn't even started yet. We have cranes up in the background where the hotel site was, and that was basically us getting started. Again, you see, again, most of the infrastructure uh, that was in. We also, the slowdown in COVID helped us uh, in, in certain aspects as well. So we, we were able to get a lot of the utilities in uh, prior to starting, which was which is a huge win for us. A lot of the main sewers actually run through uh, the golf site. Uh, so we had to bring that through the golf and get to our hotel. Um, uh, side as well. In addition to that, um, we kind of hit a, a dip. So we ended up buying this job out, call it end of 2020, beginning of 21. 
Uh, we had a dip of about that four or five percent. We that's what we saw, and we actually had a GMP ready to go in 2020 before we started construction on the hotel, but we hit it in 21. Uh, so we 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 kind of kind of won on that side of things. Um, in addition to that, um, we were able to see what was going on with COVID. Unlike a lot of developers that were in the middle of it, we were actually developing a hotel in Oklahoma City um, at the time. And a lot of the lead times went from a standard six month to a year, year plus. So it allowed us to kind of actually plan uh, for those extra long periods. And we actually bought and put everything uh, on the site as much as we could. We kind of just slammed it in. Uh, this, is, this is actually a picture of uh, us flying in. One of the cool things we were able to do is fly in the light standard. So we had formed or shaped all of the short course. So we didn't want to drive tractors and cranes over it. So we actually flew this in. It wasn't that much more money. Honestly, it's probably about the same cost. And we did it in about uh, kind of a quarter of the time we normally take. Next photo real quick. I know we're out of time. Uh, this is actually a video. We actually, the tree that's in the entry of our courtyard at the hotel actually came from the site, the homestead site. And then, and we won't play the whole video, uh, but you'll see, we actually moved it. There's these kind of these inflatable I don't know what you can call them balloons, I guess you can call them. Um, and that, they kind of, the tree rolls over the top of them. So you can imagine it rolls, gets the end of it. They pull the one on the back and put it in the front. So that, you'll see those kind of operations. It took us about two weeks to get it from its location all the way down. And it sat uh, in that location for about three years um, and lived, thank goodness. Um, but it was quite the operation. You, you can't transport something like this on the highway. Um, so to do it on our site was, was, was pretty special. So. And there it is in its location. So we were, I think we both took a big gulp when we noticed how many pumpkins they had stuck on top of the roots. <laughs> when we came in, I was like, oh, I hope that's going to work. So, but that's, that's everything we have.